Hello, hello. This is Dr. Brian Curtis with Fossil Crates, and I'm about to share with you my first impressions of watching Prehistoric Planet Episode 1. The CGI is over the top incredible. The music was very interesting. The whole ambiance was wonderful. It painted a picture of a prehistoric planet and their visual artistry is definitely to be commended. So I don't want this to come off as hater aid or someone who's really unhappy with the overall show, but there were a number of pieces from the science, Brian, that said, hmm. Whereas if I was younger, Brian, I would have been like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I just saw that. So I get the allure and the appeal. And so I have to watch it with two lenses. One of my just popcorn eating fan. I don't care about the science so much. It's directionally correct. They tell a great story and I enjoyed it. But the critical science, Brian, kept wondering what reference is that from? What paper is that? How have I not heard of that? The very first thing I noticed was they went with no lips on the Tyrannosaurus Rex. As a person who's comfortable with it having no lips, I think that's pretty cool. I'm sure you lip fans out there are very disappointed, but they did go with no lips and I'm gonna go with that for now. I liked it, I thought it looked right. If you've ever swam in the water and you've experienced what it's like to swim around a seal or a sea lion or a dolphin, you realize how utterly incompetent we land lovers are in the water. So though it goes out of its way to say, hey, the T-Rex is really cool and powerful, I'm not at all thinking that that T-Rex would get in the water to swim across an island. I don't care how juicy that rotting turtle smells. And we'll come back to that. But why would you then take your little ones across a bay? It just, it made no sense to me. And we know animals do things that make no sense to us too. And humans, we know, do lots of things that make no sense. But it struck me as utterly perplexing. Number two, if you're that giant Mosasaur coming up after the T-Rex, you simply grab it and then dive. The T-Rex has no capabilities. It said it can defend itself, but how? It relies on the strength of its legs to give it push to get that big bite working. It has nothing to kick off of. You try to kick off water, you go nowhere. The little kid of me loved the drama and the excitement. Having them all cluster together, the little baby staying right up to the adult, it made me laugh. If I was the Mosasaur, I'd be like, wow, you're saving me all a lot of trouble. I could just swim right up take a good chomp out of all of them and get as many as I can in one bite and move along. Why did the Mosasaur linger for so long? Why did it hang out? With a couple swishes of its tail, it would have easily overtaken the babies for sure and the adult too. I thought the scene was beautiful. I thought the visuals were great, but the scientist in me was wondering why that's the case. Now they started talking about T-Rex laid 15 eggs and those eggs, they lost 66% of them in the first year. I suppose we're looking at some kind of ratite data maybe on egg laying. I don't know. To my knowledge, we don't have a Tyrannosaurus Rex egg nest. And how do we know how many died in the first year? It's wild speculation. Now, is it wrong? That doesn't mean it's wrong. We definitely can make a hypothesis. But how do we test this hypothesis? That's as scientists, we should always be thinking of how can we test our assertions? And you might be saying, hey, Brian, Settle down, BC. This is just movie. It's a good, clean fun. And on one hand, I agree with you. But if you're looking at it critically and thinking about things, you're probably wondering, well, how do they come to that conclusion? I know I was. It walks up to a two-ton helpless on land sea turtle. I don't know if you've ever been around sea turtles on land, but if you get behind them, they're really not going to do much to you. And if you weigh eight tons as a big T-Rex does, what does it have to fear? In fact, I don't understand why it just doesn't just stomp on the sea turtle's head and kill it. And now it's got fresh sea turtle. So they were clearly calling back to the hypothesis that T-Rex has an incredibly sensitive schnoz because of its very well-developed, highly convoluted nasal turbinates. And these nasal turbinates are found in turkey vultures and animals that use their snows to smell out carrion. I also didn't see any seagulls. I didn't see any kind of primitive birds, nor did I see any pterosaurs eating on this. There was clearly a lot of fly. Why does that T-Rex have a midline set of tiny proto feathers? If you look closely on the very first scene, you zoom in on the back, you'll see feathers. When we do find the T-Rex mummy someday, and I wouldn't be surprised if we do, I'm very confident it won't have feathers or proto feathers running down the midline. When they had the little ones running around, they reminded me of little ratites. 
little tiny baby two-legged ostriches and their cousins running around today with that camouflage pattern they had. Uh, you watch birds, they peck at everything. And the Tyrannosaurus rex leaves its mouth with everything. I mean, that's what this thing is. It's this gigantic toothy maw of destruction. And yet the baby Tyrannosaurs were not pecking at anything. They were stomping on it on their foot, which birds will do too. But it did strike me as very peculiar that it didn't just go ahead and put these things in their mouth. Even though they're trying to make the point you have to start from somewhere and you don't, you're not born learning everything, how the little ones weren't just shredding the sea turtles. And where were all the other birds and pterosaurs? I've actually released sea turtles and the birds are just waiting for us to get out so they can swoop down and grab the, the baby sea turtles. They're good eating, apparently. He talked about the most powerful bite belongs to Tyrannosaurus in nature. And yet it flips it over to get at the soft underbelly. With such a powerful bite, especially on a leatherbacked turtle of some sort, why couldn't it just tear through the top? Now we move to the pterosaur component of the show. Looks like they did a bunch of callbacks to actual living birds, except pterosaurs aren't birds. Pterosaurs and birds split long, long, long ago. So they attributed a ton of characters to the pterosaurs that uh, ostensibly were taken straight from the feeding grounds uh, on various bird colonies. I imagine many of you hadn't heard of Phosphatodraco or Tethodraco or even Alcyone. The whole overall scene of the baby Alcyone's trying to fly to the forest, the misty forest, reminded me of Star Wars. They were the rebel forces and the Barbiodaculus was the empire hunting them down, the TIE fighters going after them. The music reminded me. It was incredibly cool to watch from a drama standpoint. I have no way to know if that's how they fought or how they lived and died, uh, but it was an enjoyable story. Barbara Dactylus is a nyctosaurid, and they went all in on nyctosaurid head adornments. Because I'm not 100% convinced that that nyctosaurus uh, cranial adornment is real. We've actually collected dozens and dozens and dozens of nyctosaurs and never found a single one that has anything remote to that bizarre nyctosaurus uh, cranial adornment that is in a private individual's home uh, that was purchased from a commercial collector that uh, a paleontologist was allowed to see. But it just makes you wonder, it's too good to be true if you only find one. And granted, it can happen, but pterosaurs in the Western Interior Seaway are quite well known. But I'm way off the, the conversational path here. So let's stay with our pterosaur friends. So how do they know they lived in the forest for five years? Are there histological studies that indicate that magically on the sixth ring, they were out in the ocean and rings one through five and the lines of arrested growth from histology that they were hanging out in a different environment? Maybe it's testable. One of the cool things about shows like this is it introduces me to how little I know outside of my uh, area of specialty, which is sauropods. I love the seaweed nest. I just thought that was so cool. And I was curious as to, do they have egg toots? And if not, or if so, either way, when they're born, shouldn't they be covered in some kind of goo, some kind of egg sack? Sure, a lot of people love the whole storyline of the mom being a devoted parent to the baby for years, keeping it safe, showing it how, or at least leading it to rocks. You can't make it swallow, but you can certainly take it to the rocks and it figures it out. But then I think to myself, is there any evidence of this? I can't think of any reptiles that live with their young for that long. Now we have nothing like plesiosaurs today. The plesiosaur brains are pretty tiny in the grand scheme of things. So I don't know if you ascribe that Wonderful long-term parental care requires a larger brain. Plesiosaurs are not the animal that I would choose to be poster child for raising young. When the Mosasaur, Kaikaithilu, attacks off of Zealandia and the pregnant mom has to hang back and dives, is there any evidence of even whales? Would a whale, would a two-year-old whale throw itself in harm's way to save its pregnant mother? I don't think so. Now, would other whales run in and, and help defend it? That's quite believable. But these are plesiosaurs we're talking about. And they made the point that these were all possibly related and it's in their best interest that the offspring be born and that the mother survive. This smacked of applying well outside of testable hypotheses within that group. Now, if you showed me some 
ancient whales like the Oligocene Jangusetus, for instance, doing this. Okay, sure, no problem. I can get with that. But uh, my brain struggled to accept that these plesiosaurs were doing this incredibly complex parental care behavior and then family group behavior. The whale-like lifestyle stems from a paper in 2011 that described a mom and baby plesiosaur. The baby was large and inside of the mother when she died. And the author noted that the only reptiles that do this is a kind of skink called Egernia and they actually do have some parental care and the ability to recognize relatives. They're arguably the smartest reptiles. And the thought is that the plesiosaur may have experienced a similar lifestyle as whales because whales have one baby they carry for a long time before birthing. So that's where this idea stems from, is a 2011 paper on a gorgeous specimen. Where are their external nares? I'll have to go look at the skull and see, do they not have external nares? There was never any steam when they came out. It always showed them gulping for air. Another thing that I found very fascinating was how they chose to keep in almost every scene the range of motion to be very limited horizontally. Dorsal ventrally, top to bottom, they had a lot of range, but they weren't this serpentine, snaky neck. So they honored these zygopophysial articulations of the cervical vertebrae, which I really appreciated. Uh, there is some uh, debate over how much flexibility is in these beautiful necks. But then when the baby was born, the mom curled that neck really far around. If you go back and check out the scene, it immediately jumped out at me watching the range of motion on the necks. I did really enjoy the gastrolith scene though. I was amused. And then that made me wonder how many plesiosaurs died choking on swallowing a gastrolith. You know, it had to happen. The eyes were bigger than their stomach, literally in this case, and they just didn't make it. Having them have courtship displays where their necks pop vertically out of the water, um, a little bit of you know, subtlety there, a little nod to the adult, a little snicker, I don't know. Uh, I did think it was a very creative courtship display. I thought that was amusing. And so I giggled and enjoyed them overall. I'm a sucker for anything with a really long neck. And uh, I enjoyed the plesiosaur segments overall except for the way that they lived is this parental whale-like Cetesian style existence. Speaking of Star Wars, I was reminded of the Star Destroyer when the giant Mosasaurus Hoffmany swam by. And then when it approached that really tiny fish, which I was wondering what was going on there, I suspected something like that feeding station would happen because why in the universe would a Mosasaur go to any amount of energy expenditure to eat a fish that's the equivalent of eating a Tic Tac, unless it's really flavorful, I suppose. But seeing that it was a pictodont and it was going to go ahead and go to town cleaning it, I giggled and enjoyed that scene. Uh, what I really appreciated was how the highlighted those teeth up in the mouth, those pterygoid teeth up in the roof of the mouth, uh, absolutely spectacular. They're crazy to see in life and it was neat to see them replicated in the video. Did it slough off its skin? Yes, it's a lizard relative. So they really gave it lizard characters, a forked tongue. Is there any evidence of a forked tongue? I don't think a tongue has been preserved to my knowledge, but I don't know the first occurrence, confident occurrence of a fossilized forked tongue. I'll have to poke around on that. And then the sloughing of skin. It has scales like a lizard. So it had it being skin sloughing off and being cleaned. Well, we know turtles go to sea stations today to get cleaned by cleaner fish. So it's not out of the, the realm of impossibility. And I really enjoyed uh, watching the scene. I jumped when the, the rival male showed up and attacked. And then it was the classic speed versus weight. Um, the weight is great if you get on top, but you got to get there and speed wins battles. And so they acknowledge that they can go either way. I was really expecting them to kill off one of them, uh, the younger, lighter one that hadn't had the opportunity to catch its breath. And then it would pan down to it at the bottom and show how we get some of these gorgeous fossils because it's dead on the ground. Now, when he said that there was a tooth embedded in the Mosasaur, I immediately wondered what specimen. For all of you paleoichthyologists and for all the paleontologists to study invertebrates, I wondered, were you trying to figure out what genus of fish that they had swimming around in these beautiful areas? And then if you study the inverts, were you trying to rattle off your list of late Cretaceous um, 
corals and sponges and shrimp. Are there photo sites in the fossil record from ammonites from Lake Cretaceous? Again, it, it's a logical leap. It, it's possible. I mean, they do it today. They're relatively unchanged, except wait, all the ammonites are extinct. We have no living ammonite. So we have nautiloids and they do it, but nautiloids have split from ammonites long ago. So I love bringing in the modern animal behaviors into the past, but at the same time, I don't want this generation of youth thinking that these are knowns, that we know these to be true. These are wild speculations, wild a bit harsh. These are speculations that are applying modern day examples into the past. So it's reasonable, but how do we test it? We have to find an incredibly well-preserved specimen. And why couldn't they have done things our own way? There's a lot of million years that have happened that could have had some cool iterations that we'll never know. What could that group of, of plesiosaurs have even done? Imagine a group of snakes trying to bite a crocodile. I mean, that, that's kind of what you're looking at. You're looking at a mouth on the end of a long neck and no one has sharp teeth. Those are fish eating teeth. Those aren't mosasaur penetrating teeth. And even if there was half a dozen that's striking them, unless they hit them in the eye or maybe bit that forked tongue, there's really not a lot of damage they're gonna cause. But the mosasaur is downright lethal and can crunch through their necks. So I just found that whole scene, though beautiful, the scientist in me was perplexed and a bit disappointed that it transpired that way. 80 years, that's a long time for a plesiosaur to live. And I'm wondering if, again, if histology can even tell us something that lives that long, because at some point bone begins reabsorbing on itself and removes those lines of arrested growth that we usually use to determine age. I did love the hatching of the baby. I thought it would have been a bit messier, but beyond that, having that neck unfurl was just a moment of smiliness. But as a critical thinker, I do have lots of questions and that's what science is all about. It's about researching. It's about searching again and trying to find additional information and knowledge. So this is Dr. Brian Curtis with Fossil Crates signing off saying I hope you enjoyed my hot take on Animal Planet episode one. I'm looking forward to episode two this evening and we'll see what kind of fun I can come back with on that one. Thank you kindly. Adios.